Welcome to Vital Advice Halloween Special. Dracula, Lestat, Van Helsing, Buffy, Edward Cullen. All names of literary characters or characters in film that are all associated with a supernatural being known as the Vampire. Oh guys, I'm so excited. So this is one of those very obscure obsessions that I have. I actually have a deeply rooted and unexplainable fear of vampires and yet I'm so obsessed with them and I need to know everything about them and I have a whole list of things including real life accounts of encounters with vampires and accounts from vampire hunters that's right real life Buffy the Vampire Slayers (laughs) real life Van Helsings before we step right into it I just want to say hello welcome Happy Halloween. I hope you're doing well. This is not a normal series that I do on my podcast, but because I love Halloween, I'm doing it just for the month of October. This is the October series, the Halloween special on vampires. Dun, 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 dun. All right. So, so what is a vampire? Defining that is actually something that you would have to ask different cultures about because each culture around the world has some sort of lore rooted in a not always blood sucking surprisingly but a life force sucking supernatural being sometimes they're undead and sometimes they were never alive others are your family members and some are complete strangers so a life force sucking being now the reason why we associate that with blood sucking is the earlier uh, idea that blood was the life force and that's why they would drink blood to gain life the original lore of a vampire was not as fleshed out as we see in cinemas today what we think of as a vampire was more murky into whether or not it was also a witch or if it was a vampire, also a werewolf. It was a supernatural being and there are many crossovers between the different types of supernatural beings that we have a very clear idea of today is different from each other. So let's talk a little bit about the crossover in the original lore that we see. And I feel like even in literary vampires, there's still a little bit of crossover that we see in the way that we talk about vampires. So the undead is where we usually associate the idea of a vampire. But then wouldn't the Sanderson sisters from Hocus Pocus also be vampires because they came back from the dead and they were life force sucking beings. So how is that different from a vampire? It's that kind of crossover that we see pretty more prevalent prior to the literary vampires uh, made by Vampire and Dracula and so forth from there. So I thought that was kind of an interesting introspective that I made up myself. I'm very proud of myself. That's right. The Sanderson sisters are actually vampires. They're not witches. (laughs) A lot of the uh, international words or words from Europe that are associated with vampires kind of cross over with witch a lot. Uh, There's things like Strigoi, which is also similar to the words uh, uh, striga in Italian, which means witch, but it doesn't necessarily mean witch itself, if that makes sense. It's like inner, it's like supernatural being type of magical being. Sometimes even the uh, association to vampire is also ghost in many languages, like ubar. Ub- I, I'm not saying it correctly. I'm sorry. The ubar, the ubar, ubir, ubir probably Ubir, that's also associated with ghost, not just with a vampire per se. So how would you know if like you had no access to the internet, you've never read Interview with a Vampire, how do you, how does one identify a vampire 
compared to other corpses that are just sitting in, in the cemetery? Like, how would you know that they're the undead? How would you know that they're sucking the blood of their family members um, if you've never seen them rise from the grave? Good question. Thanks to a very special writing from a military surgeon from Serbia in the year 1732, we have an account of a vampire staking that took place. That's right. A real historical account of this vampire hunter, essentially identifying a vampire, staking him, and then saving a village from the vampire's blood-sucking lust. <laughs> so... Serbia. Let's set the scene, okay? Serbia. 1732. 17 villagers died of a vampire attack. This was believed to be a returned military. I don't know if he was like a soldier or, or like if he was in the Navy, but he returned from um, a war where he had encountered a vampire, was bitten, but thankfully he killed that vampire and then ate the dirt from the vampire's grave uh, to prevent himself from becoming a vampire. Unluckily, he fell off of a carriage on the way home and died. It would, it would, you know, like if you started seeing a vampire attack, so you know, this guy encountered a vampire on his travels. You probably think maybe that graveyard dirt wasn't actually a good way to kill the uh, vampire virus within you. So that's exactly what they thought. This guy's name was Pale. Pale? Pale? I'm not really good with uh, European names. I'm sorry, but yeah, he died and they thought that he was killing 17 villagers at night. Um, so the doctor, Johan Fluckinger, <laughs> cannot say these names. I'm sorry. Went on order from the emperor to go and find out if Pale was, in fact, a vampire. So they exhumed his grave. And what they saw and is an account that the military doctor wrote was that his body was not, under his assumption, decomposed at all. He looked preserved and his nails looked longer and his hair was still attached to his head. And in his description, the body was covered in blood. So naturally, when you think that you have uh, seen all the signs of vampire, long nails, you know, stone preserved body, covered in blood after all these villagers have been like sucked of life, um, that looks like a vampire. So as any good vampire hunter should, they staked the bitch. They took a silver stake. In this case, I don't think it was wooden. And they plunged it through his heart. And in the account... Pale apparently screamed out and a <laughs> stream of blood gushed out from him, which shouldn't have been there because he should have been dead for at least like over a week, if not 30 days. I think it was a week, if I remember the account correctly. Either way, they then cut off his head and put it between his legs, preventing him from rising. And uh, I, I believe they also threw some garlic in there. So no way he can come back now, thank God. But he wrote this account of this vampire killing and it went viral, basically. Like everyone was just so enthralled by this vampire account and they were like, oh my God, we have it confirmed. They do exist. There are real vampires. Now, if we look at it from an eye of today, more than likely this military doctor's interaction with corpses were corpses that had been above ground on battlefields where they start to decompose faster with the exposure of oxygen <laughs> and underground corpses tend to last longer without that exposure to oxygen. It's also very common as corpses begin to decay for the skin around their fingernails to shrink, giving the appearance of them growing longer and <laughs> for your hair to stay intact longer because of the lack of exposure to oxygen and the scream <laughs> that Pale probably, I'm going to still say that that happened, but I don't know if it was an actual scream or if it was just a noise of the gas within the corpse being let out. When you, you puncture something filled with gas, it, you know, it, now the blood on the other hand, why he was covered in blood, 
I can't account for. So maybe he was a vampire. Who knows? But thanks to this account, there was a confirmed, you know, I- idea of what vampires look like when they're in their grave, uh, some good uh, information on how to make sure that you're killing vampires correctly, and uh, what symptoms to look for uh, if villagers might be under a vampire attack. So let's go more modern, new world look at vampires, because believe it or not, there was a vampire epidemic in America in the year 1892. That's right. Sound like a pretty similar year to when uh, Dracula was written. I don't know, guys. I think uh, Dracula might have been inspired by a couple of things. If you, you know what I mean? So, 1892. Mercy Brown in Rhode Island dies. Kicks the bucket. And her brother starts falling ill. And his, his life is, appears to be slowly draining from him. As if at night someone comes in and uh, drains his blood every night. Looks kind of like a vampire attack. He ha- he's very lethargic, turning white. Yeah, not doing too good. So it is assumed, based by on these symptoms, Mercy Brown was, in fact, a vampire and was sucking the life out of her younger brother. So they exhume her grave. <laughs> and lo and behold, a body without oxygen. She had longer fingernails and her hair was still intact and her skin seemed flush, quote unquote. So they cut out her heart and they burned it and then fed the ashes to her little brother. There's a lot of eating of the vampires and as like a cure for vampire attacks, which I find fascinating. Like that guy, Pale, ate the vampire grave dirt and now we're eating the ashes of a vampire heart to cure ourselves so fascinating um either way though that kid died so it was more than likely based on uh the later study of this epidemic of vampires in robot island that it was actually a um consumption epidemic which is tuberculosis so if you look at the symptoms between tuberculosis and the symptoms of a vampire attack, they're actually quite similar. And I have a feeling that a lot of the quote unquote uh, vampire epidemics that cause a lot of graves to be exhumed and for corpses to be deformed and parts taken out and garlic thrown in were because they were actually having an epidemic of consumption. (laughs) So, yay. This really is just an account of like, you know, knowledge is power and ignorance is bliss. And without knowledge, um, people do shit (laughs) that make no, that doesn't really make sense. But regardless of modern interpretations, regardless of what I think about it, to these people, vampires were real. And there is an, a headstone in Rhode Island that was um, made in the year 18, it's in the 1840s that uh, says that the man Simon Whipple Aldrich had succumbed to consumption's vampire grasp and was taken and like that took his life. So in a way, they almost kind of acknowledge the fact that consumption or tuberculosis was a little bit like a vampire in and of itself. So let's look at it that way. So if they could place blame on someone for being a vampire, how would they know for sure that that person is a vampire? Is there like a list of ways to become a vampire? Yes, in fact, there is. In fact, it's a lot more varied than we would like to believe. I feel like thanks to literary vampires like Dracula an interview with a vampire and even our more um, Hollywoodized ideas of vampires even within Twilight there is a idea that first a vampire must bite you and then you must suck a vampire's blood in order for you to have the vampire illness or (laughs) the transition into the undead however you want to look at that However, that was not historically how it was viewed. Vampires were not just the victims of a vampire bite. You could become a vampire 
from. <laughs> and here, here's the list. Obviously, the first one is Vampire Bite. Got it. But you could also become a vampire from certain sins that you committed, like murdering people. Murderers were high risk of becoming vampires when they died. Being in, buried improperly puts you at risk for becoming a vampire. Uh, committing suicide you probably are going to become a vampire being cursed by like a witch or by like a gypsy or something like that you're a vampire alcoholics were at high risk of becoming vampires cat jumping over a grave more than likely that dead person that didn't even do anything wrong but you know was already dead and a cat jumped over it now a vampire uh drowning vampire having a stroke vampire um, certain diseases, you're going to become a vampire like tuberculosis. Being born around Christmas time. That's right. All you babies in December, you're at high risk of becoming a vampire when you die. I'm just saying. Better watch out. Not just for Santa Claus. It just sounds very much like if you sneeze the wrong way on the wrong day, you are at high risk of becoming a vampire. It's not just a bite. Like you just, you do something wrong, you die um, a sinner, you die a murderer or an alcoholic, and bam, you're going to be plaguing your family's house for the rest of your existence until they get rid of you. Naturally, we as humans are trying to find a way to prevent this from happening, because if you believe vampires are real, then you need to make sure that you are safe. And uh, what are some ways to do that, you might be asking? Well, if you're religious, obviously a cross, holy water, the Eucharist, in fact, um, in the book Dracul that I'm reading right now, they uh, make the Eucharist into a piece with holy water and use it to seal up the windows and doors to keep vampires out, which I think is unique. Okay, so there's a couple ways. Uh, another way is a very well-known one, garlic. But why? <laughs> I understand a cross. I understand the Eucharist. I understand holy water. Because these beings are not of God, right? They have been, they have been cursed and uh, cast out. That's the idea of what a vampire is. It is the undead. It is no longer a holy, um, the spirit. I don't know. I, what? However, you want to look at it from a religious point of view. However, what the hell is with garlic? <laughs> Why is this 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 vegetable so prized in uh, vampire hunting? So I did some research. I got the answers for you. Garlic. It is used as medicine for one thing. So you have that root of them um, as doctors in general using it as a way to uh, help with blood flow. It's really good at keeping illnesses at bay. It, it's traditionally used as a, um, a medicine type thing. But it also is a natural bug repellent. So we have a visual of bloodsuckers like mosquitoes not wanting to come around garlic so in our brains like keep something unwanted away i actually uh witnessed you can look this up on youtube it's the coolest video on youtube i feel like there is a snake that is a venomous snake on one side of a wall of garlic it's not a very high wall it's like it's high for a snake but not for us like this wall of peeled garlic is keeping the snake from going over to the white mice that are on the other side of this garlic and this snake will not cross the garlic this is where we get the foundation of something that is venomous something that will bite us like a mosquito or a snake is repelled by garlic we have a visual of it we can see it happening so that is why <laughs> this folk medicine is used with vampires isn't that interesting there's a couple different lore attached to, to garlic i just want to throw in here there's one that is uh, a greek myth that there was a physician who was so good at saving people he could even bring people back from the dead and Zeus was like I just don't feel like you should be alive anymore I don't like that so he killed him and uh garlic grew on that physician's grave and it's used as like a physician's tool because of that guy and then there's this other lord that um anywhere that Satan walked on earth where his left foot hit garlic grows i don't understand how that's helpful i don't understand like the association of like satan walking on earth and garlic repelling vampires like i don't make that make sense to me i can't figure it out but that's the two lore behind garlic and uh, so that's a way to keep vampires at bay this is actually still practiced in romania to this day yes in romania they are still very highly aware 
of the possibility of vampires plaguing their villages. And they will rub garlic on the inside of a coffin to keep the corpse inside. There's also other practices that I think absolutely like really cool. And there's this OCD aspect that we have associated with a lot of supernatural beings, including witches. So this is another layer of overlap between vampires and witches. There's this idea that vampires and witches both have to count something in order for them to pass through. So if like for witches, it's the bristles on brooms. So you would put a broom outside your door and the witch would have to count each last bristle of that broom before they could come into your house. It was like this OCD, like they half they're obsessed with having to count it. And that gives you time to escape because they'll be so focused on counting bristles. So with vampires in Romania to this day, there is a practice of putting poppy seeds in the coffins of this, the deceased because the undead will be so obsessed with counting each last poppy seed, which are teeny tiny little seeds, before they can rise from the grave. And then you also have the garlic rubbing around there. Uh, there is also uh, a practice of filling instead of just dirt into a grave, filling it with pebbles, because then the vampire will have to count each last pebble <laughs> in the, instead of just like, you know, leaving like they normally would. They would have to be like, damn, I got to count. I just have to. <laughs> I love vampire lore. Like this, this shit is so funny. So those are some ways of keeping vampires at bay. There's also um, like other practices that are more ancient of like, you know, putting their arms as a cross on their chest or actually staking them. And in Romania, they'll, they'll do a staking with a needle in the ear to keep the uh, body pressed to their coffin. They will also put in cell phones into uh, graves now, just in case the undead wants to contact their family from <laughs> the beyond. They just want to make sure that the vampire doesn't rise. <laughs> so hopefully they, they enjoy playing cr Candy Crush on their phone in their in their coffin that's like it's crazy to think about but it's actually really like stays true to their heritage and yeah so vampire burials anciently would do staking and they would stake really big wooden or metal stakes where they would go all the way through their bodies to the point of them being stuck to the back of their coffin like it, it's holding them in place it's not just like piercing their heart to kill them it's like you will not rise from the grave kind of staking then there's also like the practice that we see in Dracula where like they cut off their heart they cut off their head and they uh, shove garlic in their mouth and down in, into their corpse like that's another way of like, making sure like vampires don't uh, come back to life so you might be wondering why would they in the year of our lord 2022 still be afraid of vampires in Eastern Europe countries. Well, my dear lovely people, uh, it's more than likely due to the fact that they have consistent vampire attacks, even to this day. And there's a couple of that we have uh, on on record of accounts of vampire attacks um, within the 21st century. So uh, in Romania in 2004, there was a man who was talking to a young girl who was uh, depicting some sort of vampire attack that she was experiencing. And the man took charge because he's like, there's not going to be any more vampires in Romania while I'm alive. And so he went into the um, graveyard. He exhumed the grave of the person that she said was, you know, being vampiric to her. He cut out that person's heart and cut off his head pretty, you know, modern practice of how to kill a vampire. That was in 2004. There's like a couple of others, like in the year 1970 in England, even not, not just in Eastern Europe in 1970 Highgate Cere uh, Cemetery in England, there was a vampire sighting and this caused like mass, like exhuming of graves in Highgate Cemetery, Highgate Cemetery, where they were trying to locate where the vampire was. Like they were opening up, trying to identify it. And they used um, all the different like ways of trying to uh, identify a vampire in those exhumed graves. So it's not just those Romanians, peeps. If you go to a funeral in Eastern Europe and Serbia, that area, right? In Romania specifically, there have been other people who have count encountered what they 
assumed might be the starting of a vampire burial where they they do a christian ceremony but they make a very shallow grave for the for the person who has passed on and then they after the christian ceremony will dig it up again and then stake that person down just in case like we just don't want we just don't want to risk it right I wouldn't want to risk it. I mean, like maybe we should all be starting to do this more often because I'm I'm pretty I don't want vampires coming in. I just don't, okay? All right. So So we know what vampires look like when we want to identify them in their coffin. But why is it that there is no description of fangs when they talk about these vampires? Have you heard anything about fangs? I haven't. It's long nails, it's hair, it's preserved body. That's pretty much it. We get this idea that vampires have fangs and are like have extended teeth from Dracula. Dracula was very foundational in the way that we view vampires in modern society, especially within literature today, including Edward Cullen. Believe it or not, he's actually very well fleshed out within vampire lore. In my opinion, even more so than the more, how should I say, <laughs> the uh, more highly praised versions of vampires within like Underworld and even Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is my preferred version of vampires. You see, before Dracula, vampires were just corpses that would feed off of the living. There's even a, a tale of a corpse that came into a house of a friend after he died and drank all of the water that was left in the house and then spit it into the mouths of the sleeping family there and killed them, which created this like kind of crazy fear phobia of having open basins of water in your house when you go to bed at night because the living dead might come in and drown you with that water. So it's more of a shift in the way that we view what is dangerous and with bram stoker's dracula he took that concept and made it sexy he was like yes the living dead these disgusting smelly corpses but make it rich make it powerful make it intelligent and make it sexy if you look at the even like the the women vampires within stoker's concept of what vampires look like they are very sexualized and at that time was very taboo to be so so in a way and this is actually something i got from my sister and i think it's a brilliant look at twilight in a way it's like a rever like a revamped version inversion of dracula during that time with dracula being sexual and and women expressing their sexuality was taboo and now being a virgin vampire, as Ed Edward Cullen is, it's uncommon and it makes him a vampire in a way. He was different. He was not walking among the norm of that time. So I think that's actually a brilliant look at that. But with Stoker's Dracula, we have fangs coming out. We have a intelligent, regal gentleman who can walk amongst the living and no one would know that he's a vampire. They have abilities to control animals and turn into animals and different like shapeshift. They can be mists, they can be ghosts, they can be, they can crawl up walls and, of castles and stuff like that. He creates the vampire that even Anne Rice, I feel like, pulls from in her work. The her work is less so about a mythical being that can turn into shapeshift into different beings and that it, it still takes from that concept that they're regal beings that they're intelligent rich royal beings with Lestat and all of the other vampires are very gentlemanly and they're brutal and in her work it also kind of walked that line of morality a little bit um, even with the child vampire, like it never, it was all taboo. And that's kind of what the vampire represents in modern or quote unquote modern literary view of the vampire is they are the enticing part of what makes a villain. They are, they're, they're sexy yet scary. They're overpowering yet somehow desirable. Now, do 
actual vampires exist. I don't know if I can say 100% that what we understand vampires to be exists, but I do know that there are at least emotional vampires. There are, they don't drink your blood, but they do suck your life force, right? And those emotional interactions that you have with people where they just take and take and like they're these black holes that just suck everything out of the conversation. I've read a couple of articles on, I think it was Psychology Today, and it talks about the five different categories that they've identified of quote unquote energy or emotional vampires. There's like a narcissistic one. There's the dramatic one. There's the victim. Like they're, they're the type of people that when you have a conversation, you know what's going to happen, that you're just going to have to eventually leave the conversation and recharge yourself because they've sucked you dry. I know every last one of us has encountered this type of person in our life. So in fact, you've met a vampire. Doesn't that make you feel cool? Happy Halloween. Enjoy this mystical season with all of the emotional vampires just sucking us dry. <laughs> for time's sake, I'm going to have to cut this short because I could talk for hours about everything that is about vampires, whether it's real life encounters with the vampire hunters or the literary or film versions. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about vampire diaries like that goes on for how many different seasons and different branches off of the show I, I, I barely mentioned Buffy and that has Angel and Buffy and a movie like there's there's so many different depictions and lore within those genres of vampires that I didn't even get into so I believe it was Anne Rice who is quoted to say that we are all as human beings for centuries have been fascinated with vampires, but it's a fascination that no one has been able to fully put into words on why. If you go to a movie theater and ask every person why they're going to see this vampire film, like what is it about the vampire that has brought you in to come and see this film? Everyone would have a different answer and the majority of them probably wouldn't be able to define why they like vampires. I think that's crazy and I think it's true. Because I don't really know. Like, I'm terrified of vampires. It's one of my biggest irrational fears. And yet, I love watching vampire shows. And I can't tell you why. I could I could put into... I could possibly conjecture that it is the idea of... <clears throat> how we're drawn in by the beast within. The controlled beast within something that could also be so loving so like you have that dracula edward cullen lestat even to some degree angel and spike within buffy like there is a demonic evil beast inside all of those vampires vampire diaries as well you have demon and all the others like there, how many others like millions of other vampires that for that one human or for that one person they're gentle but they're a beast within, you know? I feel like that's what it is for me. I really like that concept, at least within the Hollywood eyes version of vampires. <clears throat> but either way, the vampire craze is here to stay, whether it's for the real vampires in Romania or the ones we're watching on screen. How however, this is a Halloween series, is it not? So I'm gonna give you. Yeah, the best vampire hunter advice this Halloween on how to avoid vampires in a graveyard. I hope you don't go to a graveyard on Halloween night. That sounds like a really bad place to, <laughs> to be hanging out if you if you don't want to have like a ghost attached to you. But that's a whole other episode. Um, if you want to identify where a vampire is resting, all you need to do is look for the headstones that look like they have been shifting under the movement of ground so the ones that are like leaning and tipped or like falling over because it is believed that the vampire in the coffin are trying to push up on the dirt you know up to the headstone and because now the earth is being moved by the vampire the headstone's not straight so there you go if you ever see that that's more than likely a vampire grave and you should probably go out of your way to avoid it 
that's all I got for this episode. Remember to put garlic by your door, hang a cross, get some holy water. Um, and if all else fails, you know, throw some loose pebbles in front of your, like your windows and stuff like you'll be grand. Just like use their use their uh, weaknesses against them and uh, you will be safe. I will see you next week with another Halloween episode. I hope you enjoy everything I've put together thus far. Stay spooky and enjoy your Halloween. <laughs>